called me up and said they're going to go all electric by 3035. Every other company has signed up to do the same thing. So we're working with the auto industry to, to transition to electric vehicle future. This is my first video update coming to you from what was a cold and rainy Athens, Greece, but now early afternoon, the sun is coming out and it is warming up a bit. But uh, let's not talk about the weather, let's talk about the news. And uh, you saw the opening video segment of Joe Biden. I believe he was speaking at some uh, midterm election event, or perhaps he was at uh, General Motors. I'm not quite sure, but um, Joe Biden says that uh, General Motors cars will be fully electric by 3035. 1,000 years away, and General Motors will have fully electric cars. All of the cars will be electric. And you know what that means? Once uh, General Motors, once all their cars are electric, I imagine every car will be electric by 3,035. And uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, OPEC, OPEC Plus, well, they'll uh, lose the... Uh, the oil markets, won't they? They'll lose a big part of uh, oil revenues. And that would mean that by 3035, Russia, they will not have the, uh, the money, the revenue from oil to continue to finance their war machine. And uh, the Putin government will finally collapse. It's only a thousand years away. So if, uh, if the collective West, if the people of the collective West would just be a little more patient, just wait a thousand more years and uh, Russia will, will lose a large part of its, uh, of its oil profits because all the cars will be electric and, and Putin will finally be gone. So just a little bit more patience. We just have to put up with inflation and the energy crisis and the cost of living just for another thousand more years. And, and then everything's going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. So this thing caught my, my attention, whatever. It's a tree, I guess, <laughs> or someone stuck it there. I'm not quite sure, but uh, <laughs> very, very interesting. All right. Um, let's talk about, on a serious note, let's talk about two articles that came out the past couple of days. One is from the uh, Washington Post. The other one is from the New York Times. Let's talk about the Washington Post article. And uh, they are saying the CIA, Jeff Bezos owned Washington Post is, uh, is saying that the Biden White House they are encouraging Ukraine President Zelensky to um, publicly, and this is the important part, to publicly come out and say that he is ready to negotiate with Russian President Putin. Now that's what the Biden White House would like Zelensky to say publicly. Privately, the Washington Post article is, uh, is saying that the Biden White House does not want Alensky to negotiate with Putin, but publicly they would like Alensky to come out and say that he is okay for negotiations with the Russian president, because according to this article, many of Washington's wannabe allies, their wannabe allies are uh, a little turned off by the Alensky rhetoric where he continually, when he went, where he continually says that he will never talk with, uh, with the Russian president. He will never search for a negotiation or ceasefire until Vladimir Putin is replaced or there's some sort of, uh, of regime change. And the Biden White House is saying that uh, many of their uh, allies and their wannabe allies, say India, Turkey, um, all of all of the world really outside of the European Union that they don't like it when Alensky talks about regime change in Russia and those are the only the only terms that he will accept 
in order to open up some sort of dialogue with Russia. And so what, what the Washington Post is saying what, and what the Biden White House is uh, saying, according to this Post article, if you believe it, is that they would like Alensky to act, to pretend, to come out and, uh, and say that he's cool with Vladimir Putin. He's cool to sit down with, with Vladimir Putin, but behind the scenes, there's, there's no negotiating with Russia or Putin. They still want regime change. That's what the Post article is saying. And, th and I guess, I guess the, uh, the thinking is that the rest of the world, outside of the European Union, all the leaders, of, uh, all the leaders in Africa and South America and Asia, you know, Turkey, India, uh, Brazil, all of these, uh, these countries that have uh, remained neutral or have uh, supported Russia. They've, they've remained allies of Russia, for example, the BRICS. All these countries will be completely fooled by Alensky's acting. Alensky's going to uh, say that he wants to speak with Putin and these countries are gonna be like, there you go. There you go, Russia. You see, Zelensky wants to negotiate. And so we're ditching you, Putin, and we're now going to side with Biden because Alensky is telling us that he's ready for negotiations. That's, I guess, the, 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 the thinking there <laughs> is, is that all of these uh, countries are going to be duped by Alensky's uh, acting. All right. All right, if they believe that, <laughs> that's fine. So I, I just find this such a bizarre article. It's, <laughs> I mean, it kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? to come out with an article that claims the Biden White House is encouraging Alensky to, uh, to say that he would like to, to negotiate with Russia, but behind the scenes, the White House is telling Alensky never negotiate with Russia, but just say that you're gonna negotiate with Russia so that you can fool the rest of the world into believing that you're ready to negotiate with Russia so that then we can approach the rest of the world and get them on our side and isolate Russia. <laughs> anyway, that's the Washington Post article. The New York Times article, they're, uh, they're saying that Kiev is planning, or at least they have a plan in place, to evacuate 3 million residents because of the drone and missile strikes and of, uh, of, a, potential, of a potential collapse in the uh, electric grid. And um, the New York Times is saying that Ukrainian authorities, they understand that if, this, uh, if these drones and missile strikes continue, then the entire electric grid in Kiev is going to, to completely kaput. And uh, they're going to, to need to do something because you're not only talking about no electricity, we're talking about no communications, no water, no sewage, None of that stuff. And so um, they're preparing for a mass evacuation. This is according to the New York Times. Now, my question is evacuate to where? Where are you going to evacuate 3 million people to? Because if Russia takes out the, uh, the electric grid in, um, in Kiev, well, I imagine the electric grid is going to be pretty much uh, destroyed in every major city in Ukraine. I imagine all over Ukraine, you're going to have a, a blackout. And so where do all of these people go? Where do you evacuate? Three million plus, because you've got to talk about evacuating people from Lviv and uh, from Odessa all of these cities and all the villages, where do you take them? I don't know. I think there's only one route for all of these people to, to go, and that's the EU. Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Germany, Hungary. That's where you evacuate them to. That's where they go. We're talking uh, a migrant crisis, a refugee crisis that dwarfs what happened in Syria. The 2000, when was it? 2015. 
you're talking about something that could that can make 2015 look like look look tiny in comparison but uh, where else do do you evacuate these people to there's nowhere else that you can you can really take them other than to the bordering countries of the West Moldova perhaps well, Moldova has its own energy uh, crisis and so this is why I believe Europe, the EU, is going to do everything in their power. We're talking all the money they have, everything that they can do to keep the, uh, the lights on in Ukraine. And they don't have much. The EU is not going to be able to, uh, to keep the lights on for much longer if Russia continues to hammer away at the electric grid. The EU is going to try. They're going to send uh, money. They're going to send equipment. They're going to try to keep the substations uh, working. They're going to try to repair these uh, these stations. They said they're going to send blankets and, and electric heaters. They're going to try to do everything they can to make sure that the electric grid doesn't collapse. collapse. Because if it collapses, then you're going to have a big, big problem in the European Union that could eventually lead to the collapse of the European Union itself. In 2015, the EU was, was in very, very bad shape with the, uh, with the migrant crisis. Can you imagine 10, 15, 20 million migrants flooding over to the European Union? It'd be a catastrophe, an absolute catastrophe. So, uh, so that's the situation there. That's the New York Times article. And uh, while we're on the subject of Ukraine, uh, Jake the Snake Sullivan, Biden's, uh, Biden's chief foreign policy guy, he's the man that makes all the decisions for the United States of America when it comes to foreign policy. Well, he made a surprise visit to Kiev. He decided to visit Alensky and uh, and bring 400 million. He brought 400 million in weapons. And on the record, his trip was all about the U.S. reaffirming their uh, their support. I don't even know where I want to go. Let's go into the woods. Let's go this way into the woods. On the record, it, this was all about reaffirming the United States' support for Ukraine. And of course, delivering 400 million in weapons, which from what I understand are all the weapons that the US military does not want or cannot use. It's all the remaining like old, say Soviet style weapons or weapons that, that the US is just not, they're just sitting there collecting dust and, dust and they just want to kind of unload them on, uh, on Ukraine. But um, I'll put a link down below to uh, Brian uh, Berletic, the new Atlas, to his video where he actually gets into the details of this 400 million uh, weapons package that Sullivan announced while he was in Kiev. Anyway, that, that's, what the, that's what we're all supposed to believe was the real reason of this visit to Kiev. But uh, off the record, this is, what, this is why I believe Sullivan went to Kiev. I think that he went to Kiev in order to to get this Kherson offensive moving, plain and simple. Now, I don't think that he wants this Kherson offensive to start uh, right away so that he could somehow, so that the United States could somehow um, get something going before Tuesday, the midterm elections. I don't think that's the reason. I think that Sullivan wants the Kherson uh, offensive to start, even if the weather is bad, even knowing that the Russians are, uh, are dug in, They've brought in reinforcements. They're well prepared. I, I think Sullivan doesn't care about any of that. He just wants the offensive to start because uh, he would like to have some sort of, uh, of action taking place in Kherson for the time between the midterms and when the new Congress, the House and the Senate, come into session. He wants those two months to be to be like um, to be kinetic to have to have Ukraine moving, advancing. He, 
He wants talking points. He wants media spin. He wants Ukraine capturing villages. Uh, he wants all of this to go down in the two months between the midterms and the, and the new Congress because the uh, Biden White House, they want to make sure that they uh, tie up the new Congress into the Ukraine project. They don't want anyone in the new Congress. They don't even want to risk it. They don't want any risk that uh, some sort of coalition, an America first coalition in, uh, in the new House and the Senate will think about cutting funding to Ukraine or delaying funding or delaying weapons deliveries or something like that. Sullivan doesn't want any of that. So he wants to make sure, in my opinion, he wants to make sure that things are going off in, uh, in Ukraine. And none of this three, four week stasis. He doesn't want any lulls. He wants Elensky to go into Hesson, even if it means um, annihilation. Because in his mind, I believe, in his mind, he can then say, well, the Ukraine military is having a rough time in Kherson. The Russian military, they're distracted or engaged in this battle in Kherson. So we've got 40,000 American troops along with 30,000 Polish troops and 20,000 Romanian troops. We've got this little coalition of the willing, right, that we've put in place. Let's go in. Let's go in and let's create a fait accompli, as they say. Let's change the dynamics on the ground as the Russians are fighting in Kherson. Let's change the dynamics in the west of Ukraine and, uh, and make things difficult for Russia. Let's move in NATO and create a dynamic where the Russians have to make a very difficult decision. Annihilate the NATO troops or back off and accept an American, Polish, Romanian presence in, uh, in the west of Ukraine. And I think the neocons believe that Russia's gonna back off. I think they're once again drinking their own Kool-Aid in believing that Putin is, uh, is, doesn't have the stomach for, uh, for this conflict, believing that Russia's running out of missiles, that the Russian military is weak, that the Ukraine military fought them off in the siege of Kiev and all these things. I think they're drinking their own Kool-Aid and they believe that uh, if they create, they create the dynamics in Kherson, they create some movement in Kherson, then they can get NATO into the West and they can create the dynamics then for, for a U.S. military presence. Like what Brian at the New Atlas says, they can, they can create this buffer zone, what they've done in Syria. That's what they believe, in my opinion. And that may be what Sullivan is trying to cook up. So he wants Herson moving. Everything hinges on Herson. Let's get Herson moving. Let's tie everyone's hands in, uh, in the House, in the Senate. It doesn't matter if they're Republican. It doesn't matter if they're Democrats, whether they're MAGA or whether they're progressives, want to be progressives, whatever. It doesn't matter. We're going to create the dynamics. So everyone has to be on board with the Ukraine project with supporting our troops in Ukraine, with NATO being in Ukraine. And of course, the American public is going to have to buy into it as well, because, you know, you're talking about American troops, NATO troops moving into Ukraine. Right, because you can't have the Alensky regime collapse in the Battle of Kherson, can you? And of course, Sullivan may be thinking that would be the, the backup plan. Maybe if everything goes well, then Alensky does take Kherson, Kherson city. And if that's the case, well, then I can come out and say it's a victory. Look at how well they're doing. And so the Congress is going to continue to, to funnel money into Ukraine because Alensky is making, is making headway. I think that's what this, this whole uh, trip to Kiev was about. They're planning everything out, at least in their minds. <laughs> they're planning everything out. And by the way, um, you know, the New York Times is saying that Kiev is about to evacuate, right? And you're going to have a collapse of the electric grid and uh, a permanent blackout situation. But at the same time, you have Sullivan traveling to Kiev. You had the Greek president. She was in Kiev. You had the German president. He was in Kiev a couple weeks ago. David Letterman was doing an interview in Kiev. So while you have this narrative of a blackout and an evacuation, 
and of Russian, Russian missiles and drones uh, dismantling the electric grid, the water, the sewage, the communications, you have all of these important politicians and, and wannabe, once upon a time, important entertainers traveling to Kiev. How does that work? How does that work? Are they not worried about going to Kiev? I would imagine that the U.S. government would tell Sullivan, you know, it's probably not safe to travel to Kiev at this moment because the city's being torn apart. But no, nope. They're traveling to Kiev to meet with Alensky. Unless, of course, I don't know, maybe they're not going to Kiev and maybe Alensky is in Kiev. I don't know. I don't know. Who am I to know? I have no idea. So uh, let's see here. Those were the, the two big stories that caused a lot of uh, discussion over the past couple of days. And what else should we, uh, should we talk about? How about Iran? How about Iran? So Biden, when he was in San Diego on a campaign event, he said something along the lines of, we're going to free Iran, something like that. We're going to liberate Iran and we're going to give Iran freedom. And then the Iranian authorities, they, they came out to Biden and they said, you know what? We've already won our freedom. It was called the, uh, the Islamic Revolution and we won it from, from you guys, <laughs> right? We became free from, from you guys and, uh, and the monarchy. And, uh, and then Iran came out with a statement and they said that uh, this whole drone thing that you guys keep going on and on about, well, we have very good relations with Russia. This is the foreign ministry of Iran. We have uh, neighborly relations with Russia and we've never provided them with missiles, but it is true that we did provide them with some drones, some drones in the beginning of the SMO. And when Iran said that, Elensky and his advisor, what's his name, uh, Michael Podoliak, they jumped on, well, they jumped on the Biden rhetoric, but then they jumped on what the foreign ministry of Iran said, and they said that uh, Ukraine reserves the right to take out the, uh, the facilities where the, the Iranian drones are manufactured, i.e., Ukraine can, uh, can send missiles over to Iran to destroy the, the drone facilities. I don't think Ukraine has those missiles, but uh, I don't think they have, uh, the Ukrainian missiles have that range, <laughs> that's for sure. But uh, that, those were the comments coming out of Podoliak and, uh, and Alensky the other day with regards to, uh, to Iran. And so I just think the whole Iran drone thing I just think the Iranians, they, uh, they gave the Russians drones at the beginning of the SMO, and then they, uh, they gave the Russians the blueprints, the engineering specs, everything to manufacture those drones, and, and then the Russians just got to it. You know? That was it. That's what I think happened. But, uh, but Alensky, he's freaking out. I mean, he really freaked out. And he's like, we're going to hit Iran and we're going to send missiles to those facilities. And Podoliak said the same thing. And, uh, and yeah, those were the statements from uh, Alensky. He's going to open up a second front towards Iran, right? A two-front uh, two conflict. One against the Russians and then another one against Iran. <laughs> anyway, oh boy. So this is the Zapio. You guys want to walk in? There's some sort of event here. It's a free entrance. Hmm. It's like a healthcare event, but you rarely get to come in here. This is where Greece signed away its uh, future and joined the European Union. I was in this building, and this was actually, this building was actually the, uh, from what I understand, it was where 
when we had the first Olympics in 1896, this was where the athletes stayed and this is where they had various uh, events and stuff like that it was in this building, this area. So, and now it's like a convention hall. And they have conventions and stuff like that here every now and then. All right, so we talked about Iran. Good. I wanted to talk about that story because I think it's an interesting story. Then you have the whole, the whole side story of uh, some sort of conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran and that whole thing where, you know, that's just been, that's just propaganda. That's just BS that's being thrown out there by, uh, by the U.S. and the collective West because they want Saudi Arabia and Iran to fight. They don't want those two countries working together. That's the last thing they want. And they're getting spooked at the, uh, the talk about Iran and Saudi Arabia entering BRICS and the SCO and all of these things. And, and the uh, collective West, they're trying to, uh, to fabricate some sort of uh, terror attack or potential terror attack because they want to divide Saudi Arabia and Iran. That's like a whole nother uh, story right there. But uh, let's discuss now, I could talk about this UN vote that the Russians brought up. I have to be careful with the words that I use, the NAZI vote. So the Russians brought up uh, a while back, I don't know, maybe like uh, a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, the Russians, they brought up to the UN a vote for uh, the UN, for all the member states of the UN to condemn and AZIs. And at that time, all the countries voted, yes, we condemn it, except for two countries, Ukraine and the United States. It's like, I think maybe, I want to say two to four years ago. So two countries voted against this resolution that Russia put on the table. Every other country in the world said, no, nah, no, nah, we, we condemn this. And Russia brought up the same uh, resolution. They tabled the same resolution. And this time around, you had, let me get the numbers here, 105 countries voted in support of this resolution, of adopting this resolution, condemning NAZIs. And 52 countries voted against it, with 15 countries abstaining. <laughs> you went from two countries, the United States and Ukraine, voting against this, to 50 countries now voting against this, 50 countries in the world and 15 abstaining. 50 countries don't want to condemn this ideology. So I thought that was an interesting story. Um, give it a look. Look it up and, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's an interesting development at the United Nations. Just goes to show where we are at this moment in history. Before I do a clown world, Let's do a kind of, a kind of pre-clown world, <laughs> a pre-clown world. This one has to do with NATO, NATO. The talk is that uh, the new NATO secretary general is going to be Christia Freeland. So here we have an exhibition for honey, the sixth exhibition for honey. A lot of honey. Greece has the best honey in the world, I think. And so you have some of the best honey producers in the world here because we make good honey. Fantastic. It smells nice here, by the way. So, um, Christia Freeland, who's the ruler of Canada, the real ruler of Canada, and she has ties to this group that the UN was debating about. She has historic ties to them, family ties, let's say. Well, she's being uh, touted as the next Secretary General of the United Nations. What is she now? She's the finance minister in Canada. She's like the right hand of Trudeau, the finance minister of Canada. She was the one that threatened the truckers that their accounts 
would be confiscated during the protests if they continue, that's her. She's going to be the next, uh, well, allegedly, the New York Times is pushing for her to be the next secretary general in NATO. And why not? Why not? I, I actually think it's, it's quite fitting. It, I think it, it brings everything full circle, doesn't it? For Christia Freeland to, uh, to head up NATO. That's what I believe. I think it's, it, the story is writing itself. The story is writing itself. NATO mission creep in Ukraine. They want to get involved. Russia is fighting against a NATO proxy. God forbid Russia may be fighting against NATO itself. God forbid. I hope that doesn't happen, but it's a possibility at this moment in time. And Stoltenberg is on his way out. And who do you bring in? Christia Freeland. And look up her, her family history. I don't really need to say much. Or people in Canada in the comments down below, I'm sure they'll they'll uh, they'll let everybody know about about Christia Freeland but um it makes perfect sense in this story for her to to take over and she was like a journalist she's not a military expert she's never <laughs> she, she knows nothing about the military or anything like that i don't even think she's a finance expert she was a journalist she lived some time in uh in russia and sure yes where are you from I'm from here, but I'm making a video where a lot of people from outside of here yeah, are going please, to see it. Yeah, mm. yeah, yes, but we got to speak English for the video. Yeah, Tell me about your uh, your company. Actually, let me get a, 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 a shot of this. Mount Athos. Mount Athos. Tell you. Mount Athos Honey. Do you have a website? Gold. A gold award? Yes. You don't mind if I put this on video to share with everybody? No, no problem. Okay, Mount Athos, the honey is fantastic. And what is the website? There is the Golden. Hmm? The Golden Awards. The Golden? The Golden Awards. Gold. Wow. The best honey is in Greece, huh? Yes. Oh, yeah. The internet. Where can people find you, so they can buy the honey? Hmm? Athos Yis. Yes. Uh, Athos Yis. Delia. Yes. Athos Yis. Tessera. Delia. Email. Master. Gmail. Delia. Com. Gmail. Delia. Com. Yes. All right. I'm going to tell people to to find you there. Athos Yis. Gmail. Delia. Athos Yis. Tessera. Tessera. Perfect. All right, <laughs> All right, that was really good. Really tasty honey. Wow. Athos Yis. Okay, here we go. Athos Yis dot gr. Guys, if you want to get some of the best honey in the world, go to Athos Yis dot gr. So I was talking about Christia Freeland. Nothing sweet about her. <laughs> Nothing sweet about her, um, but uh, yeah, she's completely unqualified to, to head up NATO, but you know, when, is it, when does it ever stop them? Anyway, uh, I want to do a clown world, and I'm going to need to free up my hands here to do this clown world because this has to do with the Daily Mail article, and I'm going to need to put that there. Let me put this brochure in my pocket. I'll put a link to this honey down below in the description box. So if you want to get some honey, order from them. He was a nice guy, nice couple. Let's talk about Clown World now. And we got to talk about this Daily Mail article. And this one is, uh, this one's pretty incredible. <laughs> this one is pretty incredible. Let's see here. The Daily Mail and the zoo in Ukraine. Here we go. Here we go. The animals are suffering shell shock at a Ukrainian zoo after being traumatized by war. Actually, let's walk up this way. It's a little more quiet. So, 
So this, uh, this article from the Daily Mail, just when you thought the Daily Mail couldn't get any more trashy, <laughs> any more ridiculous, any more stupid, you know, they, they lower the bar even more, <laughs> right? They've surprised me with this one. So they're saying here that uh, animals in a zoo in Ukraine, the Misyatsev Zoo in Demidiv, right on the outskirts of Kiev, well, the animals in this zoo are, uh, are traumatized from the Russian invasion. Let's see here. Vladimir Putin's ruthless invasion of Ukraine has seen families ripped apart, homes blown to smithereens, and children savagely killed as part of his indiscriminate bombing campaign. But other forgotten victims of the war have been left to suffer in bleak conditions as missiles rain down around their cold enclosures. The animals of the Seven Misyatsev Zoo in Demidov on the outskirts of Kiev have remained in their pens throughout the brutal conflict. Now in its ninth month, many have been left traumatized from the nearby shelling in the early days of the war when Kremlin troops marched on the capital before they were forced into a humiliating retreat. They had to get that Siege of Kiev humiliating retreat line in there. They had to get all those lines in there, right? Putin is evil. Putin is doing it. They had to get all of that in there. So that's one of the reasons that they, uh, that they put out this story is so that they can just... It's just repackaging the usual propaganda but now it's in a different form you know now it's it's repackaged to talk about a zoo but you're going to talk about the siege of kiev and and the ghost of kiev and the zaporozhye avenger and putin's putin's evil and he's a dictator and all these things you got to get all those into an article and so you know they figured you know we've talked about all of these things we've talked about these these cities and these villages and, and, and these people why not why not talk about animals now and when we could fit all of these, this propaganda uh, that way, we could fit it in that way. And so that's one of the reasons why they put out this article. But another reason why they put out an article like this, and this is the sinister reason for them to put out an article like this. This is the evil reason for them to do this is because they want to paint Russians as, uh, um, as evil. They want to demonize them, right? Because... They could be going to war with Russia, so they want to make Russians less than human. They want to remove their humanity. And what better way to remove a, a country, a culture, a people's humanity than to say that, you know, they, they hate animals, they attack animals. Actually, in this article, it even says that the Russian soldiers would eat the animals in the zoo. Not a joke. Let me find the paragraph. Let me find the place here. It's towards the bottom where they talk about how the Russians would eat, the Russian troops would eat the animals. The rescue workers arrived 10 days later to find animal skeletons and pieces of flesh and bones scattered across the zoo grounds. Okay, so they're talking about Russia's humiliating retreat, right? They, they frame it that way. So the Russians, you know, they, they face this humiliating retreat. And so the rescue workers come in. According to the authorities, two camels, a kangaroo, a bison, some piglets, birds, and wolves were killed. Those animals that were saved are being cared for in the city of Dnipro. So yeah, and they actually have photos of like, they try to like put photos in there of the animals like in distress or, I mean, you could tell by the photography. Let me put up one photo of like this, uh, this rhinoceros and, and the byline says, a lonely rhinoceros rubs its horns against a metal gate at the zoo yesterday, more than eight months after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And here's another photo. A zoo worker pets Capybaras 7 at Miyatsev Zoo as forlorn animals face cold winter months ahead with no visitors at the zoo. With no visitors at the zoo. And so you can see what they're, what they're doing here, right? They're removing Russia's humanity. They're painting Russians as evil, evil animal killers and animal eaters. This is why the UK has to do what they're doing. This is why NATO has to go to war with Russia and everything else. Da 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 da, da right? There you have it.
is actually a very sinister article, a very sinister piece of propaganda. But the good news, the good news about this article is that I went into the comments sections. And when I went into the comments, first of all, there weren't many comments, which, which I found interesting. But um, when I did read the comments, I would say that 90, 95% of all the comments with this article realized that it was BS. And what did all the commenters say? They said, the real tragedy is keeping animals in a zoo. Free the animals. Animals should not be locked up, period. That was what all the comments were saying. So people realized that this was a piece of uh, despicable and ridiculous propaganda. And people said, it's time to free the animals. They should not be locked up. They should be allowed to, to live in their natural habitat. That was the, uh, that was the comment section of this Daily Mail article. Anyway, that is the video, guys. This was a nice walk on this Sunday afternoon. The Duran.locals.com. We are also on Rockfin as well. And uh, look for the Duran's videos on all of the video platforms, including Telegram. And look for Alexander's videos on all the video platforms, including Telegram. And go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care.